so can we start sir ravi sir are you able to hear me at all yes sir yes sir yes would you be able to share your screen sir hello yes sir hello yeah you are audible sir excellent and can you can you see me as well yeah it's a bit dim it is a bit dim Hang yes yeah. yeah let me switch on the lights please sir oh, yes sir that will be great you have lovely scenery outside well you asked me to close it <laughs> no no actually everything is that any better better better, better. yes yes so sir i am starting so yeah. i just have a uh, just brief agenda of the today's meeting uh, i am dr gunadhar padi uh, consultant intensivist and coordinator uh, uh, apollo hospital navi mumbai so basically these programs are up for our dnb students every week we conduct and i thanks all the panelists and all the uh, delegates who have joined and spe uh, special thanks to dr ravi kumar sir so uh, first sir we'll have your lecture uh, for uh, almost around 45 minutes and followed by an half an hour discussion uh, from the all the delegates and our dnb students who are there in the uh, today's meeting and then we'll close the meeting sir uh, so i would like to share your slide sir by mm -hmm. the time i'll just introduce the other panelist so that uh, the meeting can be started thank you so by the time uh, ravi sir is sharing his uh, slides so uh, just let me introduce uh, my other uh, uh, panelist and uh, the faculties of the today's meeting Uh, so uh, my colleague dr akhilesh uh, from apollo hospital mumbai consultant intensivist and uh, he will he and myself will moderate this session and we have today other uh, eminent panelists with us like uh, dr deepak govil uh, sir needs no introduction consultant in charge head of the department uh, particularly sir has done lot of uh, this uh, cases of uh, liver transplantation and uh, crrts the bridging therapies and uh, i really appreciate sir has spent his time and uh, joined with us for some knowledge uh, to be uh, disseminated to our students and welcome sir deepak govil sir thank you very much for invitation thank you sir uh, with us uh, my co colleague dr divya dr divya kukian is working as a consultant intensivist at apollo hospital navi mumbai and uh, she has also done a, uh, handling lo handled lot of uh, this uh, transplant uh, uh, patients particular the liver transplant patients and uh, she will be joining the session today welcome dr divya thank you thank yeah. you and uh, with the uh, list uh, uh, dr akira rajakumar uh, i uh, she is also one of the leading uh, transplant physician intensivist uh, in chennai and with this uh, 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 let's start the program of today and uh, i'll hand over the mic to akhilesh for another brief introduction of dr akira so that the session can be started hi welcome dr akila i mean uh, uh, dr akila is uh, you know trained in uh, liver transplants and uh, uh, she has been uh, actively involved in uh, you know liver failure clinics also and uh, liver failure icus she has been trained in london and then uh, uh she has come and joined here at the rela institute of hepatology and uh, transplantation services and i i really sincerely thank you for your uh, acceptance uh, with such a short notice you have accepted and really thank you thank you to you and hopefully the students will be enlightened with the knowledge that you will be disseminating today uh another uh, uh, panelist that we have today is dr uh, uh, suresh vasant so dr suresh vasanti is uh, 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 an anesthetist and intensivist uh, in liver transplantation at the, at the queens hospital uh, london and uh, today we have the opportunity to have him with us uh, on panel discussion welcome dr uh, uh, suresh vasanti 
Dr. Shuris Vasan seems to be a little busy with his transplant, which is ongoing, but he will be joining us shortly. Uh, with this uh, introduction, uh, I hope this program will be greatly useful to all the students and the consultants in the field of intensive care. And I would request uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Ravi Kumar to initiate the discussion and the presentation today. Over to you, Dr. Ravi Kumar, sir. Thank yeah. you very much. Sir, sir, before you start the presentation, we just, uh, because a lot of our trainees are new, sir, I'll introduce you in a short, uh, uh, basically, sir is working in, uh, uh, he's a consultant, uh, intensivist, transplant physician, anesthesiologist, and uh, he's working as a uh, intensivist, uh, transplant intensivist in Surrey and Sussex NHS Trust Hospital and guys and St. Thomas University Hospital, sir. And I will just like to have a brief introduction, sir, and then uh, begin the talk, sir. Thank you, sir. Thanks very much uh, for the invite. And it, it is a beautiful, beautiful British summer at the moment here, I have to say. It doesn't get, uh, it doesn't happen that often. So my name is Ravi Kumar. Uh, uh, with regards to introduction, I, am, I trained in India, in Delhi. Uh, I did my MD medicine and MD anesthetics uh, back home. And then I trained here again in medicine and anesthetics and ICU. My, uh, I did a PhD here in uh, hepatobiliary diseases and fellowships here in um, liver and pancreas diseases and transplants. Uh, and I work as a general intensive care consultant uh, in Surrey and Sussex with inputs to uh, the St. Thomas's Hospital off and on uh, uh, and hold an honorary consultancy there. Uh, my interest, uh, well, obviously, needless to say, with that much of time, um, has been hepatobiliary uh, critical care patients over the years. Uh, I have been an EDIC examiner uh, for just close to 17 years now. Uh, we run the London Centre and I've chaired the exams for about five years, gave up uh, quite a few years ago. Um, so yeah, that's that's my background. I am a jobbing intensivist. Uh, I I see patients every single day of my life. Thanks, thanks, sir. So uh, happy to yes, sir. Okay, so uh, I was asked to uh, uh, talk about the changing paradigm of. Uh, acute uh, acute uh, decompensated or compensated liver failure uh, with as time goes on and and when i was asked to do, do this talk and i'm very grateful that you did ask me actually uh, was i i was not entirely clear about uh, the audience i'll have uh, because i thought well, there, there might be um, uh, established uh, clinicians listening to this talk there could be students, there could be exam going students, there may be some medical students, I don't know, I'm not sure. Uh, and, and obviously, uh, in any liver talk, uh, if you see Deepak's name there, you always get uh, a bit unsettled because I don't think uh, as on date in this world, anybody does more, uh, more uh, liver transplants than uh, Deepak's unit, I have to say. So yeah. Uh, so slightly unsettling, but uh, we'll share our experiences, what we do, and what we do on the ground reality. Uh, and how I plan to go about this is, a uh, lot has changed about the pathophysiology of uh, acute liver failure uh, over the years. Uh, and, and we will talk about that. It might be slightly boring uh, to established people who already know this, but certain aspects of that are quite important with regards to, I can only talk about the European Diploma in Intensive Care exams. I can't talk about um, the Indian exam systems. So um, uh, if, if it does get boring, I, I apologize, but we'll try to make it interesting uh, and we'll see how it goes. So on that note, uh, we'll, we'll start with some stats. And uh, uh, if you want, uh, uh, you're recording this talk anyway, but if you want a copy of this presentation, I would be more than delighted to share it with you. Okay, let me see if I can change this. So let's, let's talk about some 
some stats and we'll start with Britain first. Um, there has been a 400% increase of liver deaths due to liver diseases um, in, in the last 50 years. Uh, so 400, no other disease has increased by this rate. Uh, uh, and still the awareness and education of people is uh, general population, which well, uh, literate British population is so low that even just about 5% people consider that to be a worry. If you have chest pain, you, you run to the hospital uh, within the first half an hour. And in all fairness, the system responds quite rapidly as well. However, if you start to get yellow, you sit there and, and, and you mull over the problem, it will all get better um, uh, and, and let it ringer, linger. 94% of British adults uh, think that uh, your life has gone out of track and you've lost control over life if you drink alcohol and subsequently get a disease to alcohol. So the social stigma is, is very badly attached. And actually, uh, talking about the social stigma, uh, we did an audit which was published in JIX about seven years ago now, and we were looking at prejudice of intensivist for admitting um, acute decompensated alcoholic liver diseases to intensive care in their first admission. And, and the results were quite, quite telling really, because there was definitely a, a an element of bias against these people. I hope by end of this talk, you will understand that actually these people do deserve a chance. And if we manage them properly, they do well. If you look at the community, you know, uh, there are a lot of people working in the community, irrespective of which country they live in with compensated uh, cirrhosis, and they do have a life. Okay. Yes, their their uh, their lifespan is certainly shortened, and their tipping points are certainly lower. But they do have a life. Uh, okay. Moving on. The problem with liver disease, in particular, is it is essentially a disease of the young. Uh, it it takes away working life. Uh, you know, 62,000 years of working life are lost every year in Britain as on date, secondary to alcoholic cirrhosis and related deaths. 90% of liver diseases happen mainly due to alcohol, obesity, and viral hepatitis. And increasingly, the viral hepatitis is being seen more in expat population uh, and uh, and. Uh, uh, so, and the proportion of alcohol seems to be rising by the day. So these are all preventable in all honesty, the, the vaccination program and the awareness of hepatitis is, is much, much more higher than it used to be about 20 years ago uh, when I started here. So on and around, uh, as per the British Liver Trust data, um, and this is about six months old, we do about a thousand transplants a year in this country. Most of them are cadaveric. Uh, and at any one time, there are 350 people waiting. So we have phenomenal, phenomenal number of deaths uh, from end-stage liver disease uh, for, for people who actually can't get an organ. Uh, so it, it is kind of a dire situation and seems to be getting worse, okay? I'll finish with this, B won't bore you too much uh, with this. Uh, 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 Alcohol per se is 60% of all liver diseases causing hospital admissions and subsequent morbidity and mortality. About 8,000 people die from this every year. Mind you, we are only a country of 60 million. Uh, so that is a huge, huge number seems to be rising by the day. And needless to say, uh, this, is, this is no brainer or rocket science really that, uh, that the more deprived you are, uh, the higher you are likely to die from alcoholic uh, uh, liver diseases. Uh, I practice in Surrey, which is one of the most affluent parts of the UK. Uh, uh, comes up, uh, 
in, in top five affluent parts uh, in the UK. We see a lot of alcohol here. And, and what I've started calling them is, so if you look at my geographical area, it is full of bankers and very wealthy businessmen and hedge fund owners really. Uh, and we still see a lot of alcohol in them. I call them cryptic alcoholics, right? And, and the reason I keep call them cryptic alcoholics is if you ask them, they won't say they are addicted or they won't say alcohol is a problem. But when you look at them, you, you know by the bedside that, dude, you are drinking a lot, aren't you? And when you actually dwell into their history, they will say to you, yes, I do drink a bottle of wine with dinner every night. And then you say, what, what when the friends come over? He say, oh, we might go up to three or four bottles. And what about weekends? Oh, I might go uh, to, to my house in France and, and we, we will have a good, good weekend. So I call them cryptic alcoholics. They don't die as much as, as people from the de deprived area. And that's probably because they are well nourished and, uh, and, and they do look after themselves well, but alcohol does remain a problem. Costs us about eight, eight, uh, seven billion in productivity and uh, about just under four billion in direct costs every year. This, this is our data and this is uh, from the last census. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, if you look at our mortality, this is the most worrying factor. You see the trajectory of how the deaths from liver diseases have gone up um, uh, in the last 50 years. Whereas what is more worrying is the trend of deaths from other diseases seems to be either stabilizing or consistently going down. You could argue that, um, you know, uh, they, are, they are more glamorous diseases and more resources and research has gone into it and the government intent has gone into it as, uh, as well. So you could argue a case of a bit of a bias there as well, uh, as I was saying earlier. This is the international data with regards to uh, uh, the, the top figure. I, it may not be very clear, but essentially the top figure is about um, the, the mortality of males and females around the world. And you see Central Asia uh, tops that list. Uh, uh, but, uh, but if you see uh, Southeast Asia isn't that far. The, the big difference between Southeast Asia and Central Asia there is the, the gender bias seems to be more, uh, i.e. Uh, there may be a preponderance of uh, uh, males drinking more than females. And I'll come to this in a minute uh, because it is quite significant. The bottom graph uh, is, is about the risk of compensations and decompensations and subsequent death uh, in different genders. Uh, female tends to to decompensate more as compared to uh, as compared to uh, males. So they are the absolute numbers are still higher for males, but the preponderance of female decompensation seems to be getting more. And this is this is a particularly worrying factor, especially metropolitan cities anywhere in the world. It does not have to be the Western world. You go anywhere in the world, and and if you look at the data that is coming out is the level of female drinking is massively, massively increasing. Um, and, and the sad part of it is the incidence of smoking along with alcohol in, in females seems to be going up. Uh, my colleagues uh, in the panel might disagree with me on that one, but we'll uh, take it uh, when we come to the question time later. Uh, this is again a similar kind of graph. Uh, so, so I'll skip this one. And essentially I've said what I wanted to say in the previous slide on this one. How about the Indian data? Uh, now, now the, the problem with Indian data is it is very robustly collected, but it is not, uh, it is, uh, uh, what we don't know is, uh, is what is the geographical expanse of this data? Because I, I believe talking to a lot of people is a lot of uh, 
a lot of alcohol related mortality and morbidity may not be uh, may may not be reported appropriately from the rural parts of india um, and and this this data if you, if you look at it what is worrying here about india is that the incidence of cirrhosis and mortality uh, if if you look at this particular graph seems to be static it does not seem to be changing uh, and it's not to do with definitive treatment or transplant or anything like that it may be uh, because of not much effort going into primary or secondary prevention there so and and if if you look at um, if you look at uh, the yearly data here, I don't know how clear the graph is. Can you actually see it, by the way? Are, are you able to see the graph? Or yeah, we are able to see that, yeah. Uh, if, you, if you look at the, the data, the green bar for, for cirrhosis, um, uh, you see, it almost seems to have doubled, especially in this graph, if you see from even in the last 20 years, uh, uh, it, it seems to be consistently going up. Right, on that cheery note, let's talk about the liver, okay? Uh, it, it is indeed a fascinating organ, without a doubt. Uh, it may not be as glamorous as the heart uh, um, or certain other organs, but it certainly is a fascinating organ. It forms about 2% of the general body mass, and in a normal physiologic adult liver, um, about 25% of the blood comes from the hepatic artery, which supplies 75% of the oxygenated blood, whereas the remaining three quarters come from the portal vein, which only actually supplies about 25-30% of the, the oxygenated blood that the liver needs. At any one point, uh, the liver is re receiving about a quarter of uh, quarter of your total cardiac output or total blood volume that circulates every single minute. And if you get cirrhotic, or if you start to decompensate, that 25% can go to 40% and sometimes up to 60%. So fascinating amount of cardiac output may be uh, going through your liver every minute uh, as things go wrong. So what really happens? We'll move on to pathophysiology now uh, in a minute. Uh, talking about mortality uh, and as things go on uh, and as medicine develops and overall global care of every clinical disease develops over a period of time, acute decomposition in first presentation uh, in mortality within the first 90 days is, is high. It is still 15%, but not massively high. Repeated presentation, not a surprise, cause a rising mortality. So if you have an ACLF, which is acute and chronic liver failure, with each subsequent presentation, your, your uh, uh, risk of death rises by 50%. In 40% of the time, you will always get these patients um, who will have a telltale signs of, of liver failure, but you will not be able to pinpoint a cause uh, uh, some people call it cryptogenic liver failure, some people call it idiopathic liver failure, but uh, uh, surprisingly enough, uh, uh, acute fulminant liver failure from, uh, you know, things like, which were standard exam questions like the paracetamol poisoning, uh, they seem to be decreasing. And, and if you look at the King's data, King's College in London data, we hardly now transplant patients with uh, paracetamol poisoning, hardly ever do it. Uh, uh, and that is simply not because we are not getting cases. It's just our, our management at the time of presentation is pretty good. And all they need is supportive uh, management and the system clears out. So traditionally, uh, acute liver failure was considered as a circulatory disorder because uh, you, you read and look at uh, historical uh, textbooks and papers. And all it was, was uh, there is portal hypertension, uh, secondary to splanchnic vasodilatation, and uh, hence, uh, 
hence uh, uh, the portal pressure rises and rises and rises till a varices burst and the patient has hematemesis and then he gets a SBP and subsequently uh, causes death. That, that was the traditional uh, teaching. And, and that is still holds good. That still indeed holds good, but it is not the only cause. So if you think about the definition of cirrhosis, it, the two, two caveats to cirrho, or, or the two essential criteria for being cirrhotic is you need some degree of nodularity and you need some degree of fibrosis. What does that do? Uh, it, what it does is it increases the fibrosis, increases the intrahepatic vascular resistance. And uh, the, the massive uh, liver is a massive, massive reservoir of uh, nitric oxide and nitric oxide-like vasodilator products. So it reduces the splanchnic vascular resistance. Now that happens probably because of uh, myelofibroblast and we'll, we'll talk about in a later, they tend to squeeze the hepatocytes a bit too much and there seems to be a surge in a, um, uh, of, of these uh, vasodilators causing a drop in vascular resistance. So what then happens is uh, obviously uh, your effective blood volume decreases because the system is so vasodilated and that manifests as hypotension. The classical finding of, uh, of uh, a liver failure patient by the bedside, as you know, is the rapid bounding pulses, uh, pulses who look, the patient looks quite flushed initially, uh, if you can make it out. Uh, a vasoconstricted liver patient is bad news. Uh, you know, you, they, they will probably die. Uh, irrespective of what you do. And then what also happens is uh, because of the toxins release and all that and, uh, and constant, uh, constant uh, release of particularly IL-6 within the system, uh, these patients tend to get a cardiomyopathy, myopathy, which causes a diastolic dysfunction in these patients, uh, causing diastolic failures and hence the cirrhotic cardiomyopathy. Body does try to compensate for it. It really does it particularly well. And, and it's the standard physiology. Uh, you know, if you have any kind of hypovolemic shock, what happens in physiology, your uh, renin system gets activated. You have a high, high sympathetic drive. Your vasopressin systems get activated. What happens as a consequence then is uh, because of, mainly because of the AVP and the RAA system, the body tries to retain water. Uh, and as a consequence, with, with, with the aim of increasing the blood volume. But what happens as a side effect or collateral damage to that is uh, it causes significant renal, uh, renal vasoconstriction. And then what happens is eventually the nitric oxide uh, stores are finite to vasodilate the system, including the kidney. And and glutathione synthetase uh, uh, activity does get exhausted. It is time limited and concentration limited. Let's talk about portal hypertension a bit. Uh, I won't go into uh, why portal hypertension develops uh, uh, and, and the basic physiology is in medical textbooks and essentially it is increasing resistance uh, uh, and, and, and increasing resistance and increasing flow through the system and bypassing of the collaterals. But what is increasingly coming out now uh, and with the, the better ultrasound skills that intensivists have across the world um, is, is uh, increased importance or recognition of uh, hepatic portal vein gradient or, or hepatic pressure vein gradient. Um, and, and it is now a given, it, it is a bit like measuring ejection fraction. It, it is a very steep learning curve, but once you get the hang of it, you can get a guesstimate of it and it's not too bad really. Uh, as long as you are under 10, you're fine. At about a pressure of 10 millimeters of mercury, you start to develop collaterals. And up to this point, it's fine. You can have collaterals and, and things are okay. The problems arise, uh, arise when you start to hit 
or cross the double figure marks. The higher the number goes beyond 10 uh, of HPVG, uh, uh, the, the higher the incidence of bleeds. So if at, at a HPVG of about 15, you have a very high risk of bleeding. If it goes between 15 and 20, you start to get ascites and more than 20, you definitely, definitely start getting encephalopathic. The other reason, so historical teaching of portal hypertension was uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, it uh, happens because of fibrosis and, uh, uh, and uh, increased flow. There is structural resistance, but increasingly the role of stellate cells and myofibroblasts, as I was mentioning earlier on, is being increasingly recognized. Because what happens is, uh, when this happens, more and more hepatic stellate cells get recruited into the system. And these are contractile cells yeah, and, and have some pul pulsatile nature in them. So as they more and more of these get recruited, they tend to squeeze the, the portal system more and hence increasing the blood pressure, uh, the portal pressure with increasing time. And more the stellate cells get recruited, the higher your portal pressure and the contribution is these HSC cells are being recognized increasingly in time. This can be, this can be controlled. Uh, sim simvastatin uh, in decompensated cirrhosis, mostly the child poo uh, class B in preclinical study has shown some remarkably positive results, remarkably positive results. It, uh, uh, it, uh, it does not, it does not uh, reduce re-bleeding, but is being shown to increase survival in patient in cirrhosis, but it is not uh, uh, widely implied in clinical practice just yet. And, and uh, how it works is difficult to say, but I won't go into detail, it's a bit too complex. It's uh, to do with the row A and row B kinase systems, but we'll skip that for now. How is the other landscape changing? So that was the traditional teaching that acute liver failure is a hemodynamic disease. It really isn't. Increasing role of systemic inflammation is being recognized and we'll come to that each of these in a minute. Albumin dynamics. Albumin is not just about oncotic pressure. There's more to albumin just, uh, than just the oncotic and colloidal osmotic pressure. The mitochondria mitochondrial dysfunction, we'll talk about it, and uh, the oxphos or the oxidative phosphorylation stresses and dysregulation, which is increasingly be recognized in addition to the metabolic diseases that happens in them. So what happens with, with systemic inflammation? Now, 90%, or, or it says 99 on my slide, but close to 100% acute decompensation of acute liver failures will have signs of systemic inflammation. Now, does that mean they are infected? It's very hard to say. It's a bit like pancreatitis. You know, you get a patient of pancreatitis, you'll have a mega CRP and a mega white count. Does that mean they are infected? That's why the guidelines say do not start antibiotics. In contrast to that here, you will have a very, very low threshold to start antibiotics. And actually antibiotics in acute liver failure correlate with survival, and we'll, we'll talk about it a bit later again. Um, there is a directly proportional uh, correlation to mortality with the level of interleukins and all sorts of interleukins rise. Of particular interest is IL-6 and IL-10. Uh, IL-6 is particularly risen in acute liver failure and is, a, is of paramount importance. Don't get uh, flustered with these abbreviations, the PAMS and the DAMS. PAMS is nothing but uh, uh, pathogen associated molecular proteins. And you might have read it if you're reading about sepsis and pathophysiology of sepsis in general. So PAMS is nothing but what happens is uh, when, when you get an infection or bacterial translocation in these patients, the bacteria breach the wall of, of uh, the gut really, and they start to release lipopolysaccharides and flagellin kind of materials. 
and, and they then amplify and recruit interleukins and cytokines, which manifest as sepsis. So th this is ex essentially the PAMs are coming from outside. In contrast, you have, have DAMs, which is damage associated molecular proteins. These come from EVO, uh, in vivo. These comes from dying and damaging necrotic hepatocytes. So one is coming from outside and one, in, one is coming from uh, inside. They all mate with the common aim of amplifying the systemic inflammation. And this seems to be playing a major role in, in, in the generation of acute liver failure. The diagram looks complex, but essentially, uh, essentially summarizes what I've just talked until now. Let's talk about albumin. The traditional talk about albumin is low, low colloidal osmotic pressure. The fluid moves this, the hydrostatic pressure causes this, and the Starling law causes this. Hence, top up the albumin, they will get better. I wish it, it was that simple. Albumin, uh, is not just a fluid, it, it is a protein binder, it transports stuff, it detoxifies stuff. Natural albumin is pretty, pretty strong antioxidant and you know it does have some effect on immunomodulation. What happens in patients with cirrhosis and under the effects of the PAMs and the DAMs that we've just discussed is the cysteine residue, the cysteine terminal of the albumin molecule gets goes some radical changes, um, uh, and and as a consequence, the conformation of that albumin changes. So rather than being a detoxifier and a kind of anti-inflammatory agent, it starts to sway on the pro-inflammatory side sides, and and that is why. Uh, that is why the albumin, which should be beneficial and protective, starts to become a cause of concern. Now, you give these patients albumin from outside, does it achieve the same effect? The answer is not to the same degree, but certainly to some extent, it provides both quantitative and qualitative. With albumin, it's like anything in intensive care. Um, there are believers and non-believers. Uh, I was brought up in a system and I trained in the system where we believed in albumin, so I still uh, vouch for it. Right, uh, this is a schematic diagram of, uh, of the effects of circulatory dysfunction and compensatory mechanisms and the role of albumin and uh, natural vasodilators which exists in the uh, system for these patients. Talking about mitochondrial dysfunction. So what, what happens is, if, if you think about it, this is standard biochemistry. Uh, uh, so loss of oxfos or oxidative phos uh, phosphorylation. What happens is as a consequence of that, you generate a reactive oxygen um, uh, superoxides really, or reactive oxygen uh, species. and and uh, particularly in the peroxides, they are spectacularly damaging uh, to a already weak liver. Uh, not to mention that, as you know, that aerobic metabolism will generate 36 ATP uh, per molecule of glucose, whereas you take the glucose away uh, uh, and, and your uh, generation of ATP becomes one aero anaerobic, so creates a further acidotic environment to makes the system supremely inefficient. What about the metabolic changes? So what happens is uh, uh, that your aerobic metabolism is glucose dependent uh, for its efficiency and generation of ATPs. And with increasing time as the liver starts to fail, uh, Hypoglycemia, as you know, is a bad sign in liver failure. Um, that, that means you are uh, reaching an end of the game here and there's not much you can offer uh, short of transplant. Uh, it does come late if they are managed early properly and it is the cells that get starved of the glucose and the anaerobic uh, metabolism predominates. What then happens is, uh, and any, any catabolic affair is, is supremely destructive and liver is no different. 
physiology books will say that you can actually lose 80% of your liver and still live, live a reasonably normal life. And that is still correct. You only need about a quarter of your liver to live a normal life. But um, when you get starvation deprived, you start to eat on your proteins as a source of energy. And hence, you see extreme sarcopenia in muscle fibers under a microscope. And hence, you see those tiny, thin, muscle-wasted individuals when they present. There becomes an a imbalance between the saturated and the unsaturated fatty acids. And that, uh, what happens is that uh, has a significant impact on uh, tox uh, detoxifying the toxins which are circulating. As a consequence of all this, you have an ammonia overload. Um, I mean, ammonia is... is an osmotic diuretic, as you know, but it is also a fa false neurotransmitter. Now, as long as you have substantial stores of uh, glutathione synthetase, you will, you will manage that ammonia reasonably well. But these resources get, uh, get exhausted and you don't have enough glutathione synthetase. So what happens is whatever ammonia you break down in the brain, you break it down into glutamine. And that in turn is directly responsible for causing your brain swelling and, and edema. PREDICT is, is one of the studies I would definitely recommend uh, you know, to read. It is a fascinating, fascinating study. And it did take them a while to publish, partly because of COVID as well, the authors tell me. But essentially what they are saying is, if, if you look at compensated uh, cirrhosis, they seem to live, they, they, they seem to live for a reasonable length of time, if you look at the one-year mortality at the bottom uh, figure, the acute mortality in compensated stable disease is practically none if they don't come to hospital. It is during the course of the year, their mortality remains high. Compare that to the acute presentation of fulminant or acute liver failure first presentation in hospital. You see uh, the, the difference here is that your mortality, which is the blue graph, which shows death here, remains exceptionally high. And the reason for that is that our basic standard intensive care or hospital treatment for these patients are severely uh, wanting, uh, severely deficient. And that's why these patients die. And we'll come to, uh, towards end of my talk, we'll come to the mistakes that are commonly made in managing these patients. I am wary of the time, so I'll keep an eye on the time as well. Uh, and that's why I keep on looking at the watch. Uh, so I've got about five minutes. So where is the future? Now, traditionally, uh, you know, we are not talking about variceal bleeds or, or uh, banding varices. Hence, we have not talked about use of terlipressin and stuff like that. But cerlaxin is, is a derivative of the, of the same class uh, uh, in, in uh, to put it very simply, but without the overall side effects of vasopressin. Those of you who are old enough, uh, like myself, to have done intensive care for some time will realize that pentoxifylin makes its appearance every about 10, 15 years for one reason or the other. Some recommendation or thoughts come about, oh, about how about pentoxifylin? All it is trying to do is uh, uh, to work as a microcirculatory vasodilator and increase the flows, okay? Until we have these in clinical practice, we are fairly limited with what we can do. You obviously do the basic treatments uh, where we go wrong, volume oxygen antibiotic, you know, standard of intensive care. Uh, but uh, until then, albumin and turley are, are the, the only definitive treatment which can make a uh, changes to the outcome. Yes, there are other uh, garnishing or, or fi finesse uh, drugs that you can use, and we can talk about it in the discussion when we get there. So what are the common mistakes we tend to make? Uh, and, and the more I talk on this uh, uh, around the place, the more I get convinced, the more I go to different places to give second opinions and stuff like that, the more I see it. PPI, so proton pumps inhibitors, grossly misused drug in this pathology. There is this school of thought 
that, oh my God, they have had a very serious bleed, give them a mega dose PPI for rest of their life, otherwise they'll re-bleed to death. That is, uh, excuse my French, but that is nonsense. It does not work like that. The, the untoward effects of using unregulated PPIs are massive. What it does is, there is data coming out now, it increases the incident of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, unsupervised used. Uh, there's incidence that uh, you, uh, the, the frequency of decompensation is increased in unsolicited use of PPIs. And last but not the least, even if you, there are very specific indications of using long-term PPIs and the most common being a gastric ulcer, even for a duodenal ulcer or phagitis or, or helicobacter, you don't need a lifelong treatment. And even if you do, you do not need high dose. So that's about PPI. What about beta blockers? Propanenol has stood the test of time over the years, and it still is a very good drug when used appropriately. The, the two caveats to that is the when to use or when rather when not to use propanenol. Obviously, uh, common physiology would dictate not to use it in vasodilated states when your cardiac output is already low. But more important thing is you do not need a high dose propanenol. A 40 milligram propanonol is good enough orally for these patients. And what is coming off late again is uh, carvedilol seems to be uh, more specific for these patients in certain, uh, certain conditions of acute liver failure. So when would you use propanol would be the cases where the ascites is refractory, when the varices are less than one, uh, then you have a case of using propanonol. However, if you have more than two varices, ascites is manageable by diuretics, uh, uh, then, then the data so survival is better with carbidolol. You start low and, and you generally build it up. Parasynthesis, this is where we get it wrong. If you get a patient with acute liver failure, look for ascites, and if there is ascites, tap it. You may not drain it, tap it, because that changes the outcome you pick up the SBP and you, and you do the right, uh, uh, right antibiotics or antimicrobials. Where people get it wrong is this worry, oh my God, they are coagulopathic. But even in the most basic units, we live in the era of ultrasounds. And, and I find in India, you guys are absolute experts in ultrasound. Uh, you know, I think Deepak sleeps with an ultrasound uh, at times. Uh, so yes, tap it if, if you can, and, and it will change the outcome. Antibiotics, uh, there is now unequivocal data to suggest that nosocomial infection, if you get, a, if a liver failure patient gets infection in the hospital, he's more likely to die. And that's not a surprise because a hospital infection is more likely to be a MDR multidrug resistance as compared to a community infection, which is unlikely to be. Start early, start, start brisk, start broad spectrum, and then narrow it down once you have the result. The most difficult pathology to treat in intensive care, by far in my book, is hyponatremia. Hyponatremic patients carries high mortality in acute liver failure. And in, in general, in ICU, hyponatremic patients don't do very well. Now, depending upon the stage they present, they can present as hypervolemic hyponatremia or hypovolemic netro, uh, hyponatremia, hyponatremia. And sometimes you have to restrict fluid to about, we restrict to one liter a day. And it takes time and it's frustratingly slow, but that is the only treatment. Comorbidities, and I'll, I'll particularly mention about one comorbidity, which is, which is type two diabetes. There's a direct correlation of hepatic encephalopathy now with poor glycemic control. So, so comorbidities do uh, definitely make a difference. Renal failure, CKD on the background of alcoholic disease is, is bad news. Pulmonary hypertension in presence of alcoholic liver disease is bad news as an example. These patients are inherently malnourished. They try to make up for their calories by volume and what you would call as empty calories. You need to feed them early. 
and you feed them feed them more frequently their appetite is not great we tend to give them six meals a day uh, rather than three meals uh, and even if it is small portions sometimes you reach a situation where ng feed is not tolerated in them and and have a low threshold to give them tpn if needed and last but not the least there is this myth that oh my god the the uh, coagulation is grossly deranged uh, and they are all coagulopathic by and large a liver failure is a procoagulant disease although your numbers don't reflect it unless you do a proper tag or rotem you will realize yes your aptt your platelets your inr is all over the place but bar bar esophagia variceal bleeding these patients do not bleed. If you talk to our uh, chair panel member, Dr. Govil, he will tell you that they never, never reverse the coagulation in liver failure patients where they do trachees. And, and this was a learning point I learned from him many years ago. Um, you do not need to give them platelets to put in a central line or do a, parents, a paracentesis. Just use low molecular weight heptin. They are there. Portal vein thrombosis is more resistant to treatment. You can, you can treat bleeding, but once you get PVT, your survival does get severely affected. I will, I'm nearly, uh, I'm a couple of minutes over, I think, uh, and I will finish my talk uh, with this summary slide, which essentially shows you the changing paradigm of uh, liver diseases. And this summarizes what I've spoken in the last three quarters of an hour. Thank you, guys. Oh, that's yeah. wonderful insight, sir. I mean, really delighted to know a lot of uh, new concepts that you have come up with the uh, discussion on uh, decompensatory hepatic failure. Uh, it is very difficult to differentiate acute kidney injury, uh, you know, whether it is related to liver or the other factors. Hepatorenal syndrome is one of the entity which is really difficult to treat and to classify is also a little difficult. I know the guidelines have come up and there are different recommendations to diagnose hepatorenal syndrome. But how do you treat hepatorenal syndrome and how, when will you be able to diagnose it appropriately? I would like to have uh, your views on this. And there is a question also pertaining to this entity like hepatorenal syndrome. Over to you, sir. Okay. Yeah. Does anybody in the panel want to answer this, or do do you want? Yeah, to we have Dr. Deepak Govil also, sir, and Dr. Akila. If you can also, uh, would like to no, highlight. On this I would instance. like to hear Dr. Ravi's view first. So, so I did a talk about HRS uh, in the recently concluded ISCCM meeting um, in in Ahmedabad. If if you see. HRS was an unnecessarily complicated entity that was historically there. We used to call it HRS1 and HRS2. Uh, with the new guidelines, that, those, that definition has now, now changed. We now call it HRS AKI, which is essentially HRS1, and HRS NAKI, or some people call it NAKI, which is subdivided into HRS CKD and HRS non AKI essentially, and and uh, uh, the the difference is what has changed is earlier you needed a three month creatinine for somebody to be diagnosed as exclusively being HRS one or HRS two or whatever. That definition is now taken away now. What you now need is the baseline creatinine present on presentation. That is what you need, okay? So somebody presents with acute liver failure, day zero, you do a full set of bloods, you get a creatinine, okay? And from that creatinine, you start working on, if as per your lab reference, that creatinine is is more than, uh, uh, more than, I can't remember the exact figure uh, on top of my head, but I think it is, uh, in our units, it is more than three times, if I remember, I'll stand corrected on that. Uh, in addition to liver failure, uh, then 
then uh, okay you can diagnose the caveat is the same though you have to exclude sepsis okay where the diagnosis establishing diagnosis of hrs becomes increasingly difficult is the fact that uh, number one uh, is that you have to give them two days of diuretics to see if uh, uh, if if the difference is being made um, uh, in in the urine output and your creatinine numbers and last but not the least what you also have to see is uh, they have to be given 48 hours of albumin so it is still a complicated diagnosis with regards to your question about how do you manage them the management short of dialysis remains exactly the same you treat as if you're treating the liver function and maintain a mean arterial pressure this is what we do i don't know what others think really yeah sir so so uh, so before going to sir uh, this question basically i would like to uh, uh, highlight uh, some of the important uh, uh, interventions in uh, a breast to transplant in the liver failure patients uh, particularly, I will request Dr. Deepak Govind, sir, because uh, sir is uh, uh, means very expertise in doing a lot of uh, this uh, therapies like plasma pheresis, uh, like CRRT. So in which situations these things can be initiated, sir, if you can guide uh, for our fellows and our uh, students, uh, it will be a great help, sir. And there is a question also from one of our uh, students, sir, from that respect. Plasma pheresis, CRRT, Mars and albumin dialysis. Uh I can see this question, the role of Mars Prometheus albumin exchange in ALFSO and plasma pheresis. So there are two distinct things. One is when we are planning to do transplant and we want to bridge. Like in Western world, it is sometimes becomes difficult to get a donor. But in Indian context, when we are having a live, live donor, a related live donor, sometimes we can plan the liver transplant easily. Sometimes when there is no donor, then it is not planable. So there are two distinct situations as far as in my clinical practice. One patient is ALF is there, family is getting, somebody from family is getting worked up for uh, donation. And then we have to bridge that one to our time. And another possibility is where we know that in North India, I'm sure that Dr. Akila's place, they are having much more cadaveric transplants. But in our place, we hardly had any cadaveric transplants. So we day two, day one, we know on the ALF that this patient don't have got any live related donor who can be a potential donor. So then we know that either whatever we do, whether you call it a bridge or it call a desperate. So in this situation where there is no possibility of getting any donation or new liver, then of course we go for plasma pheresis, no doubt about it. So if bilirubin is high, patient is, is ammonia is high, having sign of um, encephalopathy, brain edema, then we go for plasma pheresis, no doubt about it. But in that situation where we know that in a day or two, some family related is, uh, relative is getting worked up for potential donor and patient might get a um, donor, then sometime we try to uh, wait for little time maybe uh, 24 hours or so for uh, plasma pheresis. But if creatinine is high, if ammonia is high, CRRT, we start straight away. Sir, any cutoff for ammonia means in such kind of patients? It is not the cutoff ammonia. It depends on, I'm sorry, I use the wrong word. It is not the ammonia. Mainly it is the cerebral edema or the sign of encephalopathy. Dr. Akila, can you highlight your practice? Um, in um, thanks, Dr. Govind. Um, in uh, when we consider as a bridge to liver transplant, there are several modalities which have been researched everywhere. And as you rightly said, the only evidence base so far is plasmapheresis. So um, any patient who comes to us with the fulfilling criteria, we subject them to plasmapheresis. At least three sessions we give them um, because it's very difficult to predict which patient will recover or will uh, require a transplant. So it's better to support them from the early stage. And uh, CRRT is initiated when there is sustained hyperammonemia more than 150. That predicts the onset of cerebral edema. So when it's persistently uh, more than 150 micromoles per liter, we um, start off the CRRT. 
that's what we do but uh, one one thing which is different i i think it's it's not very common in the north india is the yellow phosphorus poisoning that is very common in south india so these are patients who have severe form of acute liver injury but they did not have acute liver failure we do not have great guidelines as to how to manage them but ltsa has come up with the consensus guidelines so they recommend using plasma pharesis in these patients even without acute liver failure without encephalopathy in uh, with ali as well we can start using them so these are the indications of plasma pharesis in our unit um other extra corporeal uh, support devices that there was a question that i saw in the ch um, chat window about mars and prometheus we do not have any experience because in in all the reviews which have been performed so far they have not shown any survival benefit in patients with acute liver failure but there was one interesting finding which has come up recently i think in february us alf study group they have looked into their uh, patients over the last 21 years and they have said that mars does improve survival in patients with septal liver transplant that's a little relatively new finding which is evidence based but having said that it's not a prospective study or a randomized study retrospective data based study but none others have shown survival benefit and uh, what about the uh, cytosol uh, in in case of this acute liver failure things how frequently we use dr akila we've never we've never had to use it actually we've never used it there are a few case reports uh, suggesting it might work but again uh, no robust evidence to just so I've, so i've just replied to that question really uh, uh, with uh, i completely agree with dr kila with regards to mars um, there is a machine sitting on the side we hardly ever use it uh, uh, i i think it is very important to understand that mars is not like a dialysis machine mars is only if you're going to transplant that's only when you use mars please correct me if i'm wrong that is number 1 uh, with regards to cytosorb uh, we don't use it we don't believe uh -huh. in it and and our our reasoning is by the time these patients actually present to you in intensive care the whole uh, whole idea or physiology yeah. of you maybe a meeting mein wo bhi aapko aadhe ghante mein phone kar or the whole idea of using the cytosorb is gone because the cytokines have done what they need to do so it's pointless to use cytosorb we don't use it and we have never used it we did try it when it was first brought in last but not the least was a question about lola uh, austrians use it a lot i have seen it used uh, i'm not entirely sure about the benefit because uh, we believe that similar results can be achieved by simpler things uh, that is our take on mars by the way there has been increased the use of uh, n acetyl cysteine i mean um, every uh, physician or intensivist must have really prescribed n acetyl cysteine for all patients with the liver failure uh, what is your take on uh, professor ravi kumar and all the panelists i mean whether it should be used uh, when which is the ideal indication for uh, use of an acetyl cysteine i know paracetamol toxicity there is definitive indication but in liver failure per se especially with high sky high liver enzymes what is the role of an acetyl cysteine uh, can you just highlight on I that i can tell you about my uh, our practice uh, we will give nac to everybody full stop you know irrespective if they if if the liver functions are massively deranged irrespective of the pathology uh, we will give nac to everybody for two reasons one uh, it is a very benign drug it only has minor side effects a bit of vasodilatation if given too quickly uh, and two uh, resource constraint wise it is not a super a supremely expensive drugs and i would be quite interested in what others think as well actually yeah what is your take on dr divya about the n acetyl cysteine n acetyl cysteine uh, definitely the role in paracetamol poisoning is well known but in studies it has shown that even in liver failure with indeterminate causes other causes also it has found to be of benefit so we are using n acetyl cysteine for all patients like sir has said in the prescribed doses we have been using for all patients Well, and, uh, uh, sir, and Dr. Akila, what is your view on this? Yeah, there is a there is a question for the dose of the NAC, uh, Dr. Akila. So, where there are various doses, so what is the ideal dose? 
means in what do you use uh, first of all going by the use of nac whether it's indicated or not is yes, paracetamol poisoning it, there is no doubt about it but this has been an age old practice I agree with dr ravi kumar we use it on all patients with acute liver failure uh, as he said it's a benign drug and been in use for a long time we, we are worried about stopping it um maybe it acts by improving the sodium as uh, people from kings believe it it can improve the sodium and it can work in acute liver failure that way in an indirect way i'm not sure how much of it is contributory there yes we would definitely use in all forms of ali or alf and, and how long do you all use it um use uh, it this is this has been proven that any use beyond 5 days is of no effect even with paracetamol poisoning paracetamol poisoning i think the most recommendations are for 72 hours but this has been proven that beyond 5 days there's no use of it. yeah sir another question from uh, uh, bina uh, bina uh, is from uh, the ammonia level sees uh, means want to ask uh, so arterial ammonia or venous ammonia what do we check actually and what is the significance of uh, different ammonia level in different blood gases so govil sir look ammonia level as dr akila has said 150 correlates with uh, cerebral edema but what i have seen in my clinical practice it's very difficult to say which is the cutoff so it is much better to rather rely on ammonia level to look for the cerebral edema where it is and how fast it is developing and on the bed side we can use the um, ultrasound to identify the potential patients and then we can plan for ct scan Incidentally, at our institute, we are having a portable scanner, so that is not a big challenge to get a repeated CT scan done, except the radiation risk and the cost. But again, ultrasound helps in identifying. As far as the uh, ammonia, venous and arterial, again, it's a debatable. Many places, everybody practices the arterial ammonia, but in a ALF, if patient is not having A line, then repeated puncture becomes a very difficult and challenging task many times. But of course, majority of these patients, we put arterial line just to avoid all these things. Repeated ABGs are also needed. So most of the time, we rely on the arterial ammonia. Dr. Ravi or Dr. Akila, if you want to add anything, please. Now, of all the lab parameters that we've seen so far, ammonia is the one which is prone to have a lot of false uh, values, actually. It depends on how you sample them and how quickly you store them and process them. It has to be transported and ice cold uh, way actually so there will be a lot of problems in the way they measure it has to be in a standardized way i think if it comes from a liver unit which does it all the time then you can rely on the values coming from outside you do not give much importance to one value alone you'll have to see how is it measured so that is something which uh, a word of caution to all the postgraduates here and arterial is always better as dr Gogol said uh, we go by arterial ammonia so another question is uh, regarding the cerebral edema. So the question, if Dr. Divya, if you can highlight, what is your protocol regarding the cerebral edema management for LA patient? Cerebral edema, we, we don't use any uh, invasive monitoring for that. We uh, go by clinical parameters or we do transcranial Doppler. We've also been using optic nerve sheet diameter to look for uh, changes every day in our ventilator patients. As far as management is concerned, uh, it is uh, to give absolute uh, sedation, bed rest, uh, ventilate the patients if they are encephalopathic, avoid any stressors which might increase the ICP. We also use hypertonic saline and maintain a target of sodium of 145 to 155 in all these patients. So what will be the ideal osmotic therapy here, 3% saline versus mannitol? I know it, it may be a stupid question, you know. So many studies have already shown that 3% saline may be equivalent uh, to mannitol and mannitol may be harmful, may, be, may cause acute kidney injury. But I really want to know from all the panelists and uh, Professor Ravi Kumar also, I mean, in a real-time situation, if you have to use it, which one would you choose, 3% saline versus mannitol? Uh, Professor Ravi Kumar, from you, I mean, we can start from you. Your honest opinion on this, actually. So, so the, my honest opinion is, actually, uh, we don't see that much of cerebral edema, I have to say. 
especially in alcoholics, we don't, maybe your, your, uh, your um, demographics are different. Uh, if, you, if you consider acute decompensation in chronic liver disease or liver failure, by and large, their brains are quite atrophic anyway. So you have plenty of space in the skull anyway. So you are, you are unlikely to have a tight brain. That is number one. Uh, with acute cerebral edema in, in acute fulminant hepatic failure, they die full stop. You know, there's not much you can do uh, if, if they are presenting uh, complaint. So in our practice, I cannot last time remember, I must have used it at some point. I cannot routinely remember using any osmotic therapy because we do not get tight brains. We do TCDs. Uh, it is more of, uh, uh, more of a postgraduate training exercise rather than clinical practice on a day-to-day -day basis. And on the same context, uh, I would like to ask Dr. Akila, uh, what are the recent uh, guidelines uh, regarding the cerebral edema management in ALF from uh, one of the trainee to the, all the panelists? The question has been asked. I don't think any recent guidelines have come. I think our under understanding has just stayed there and uh, we are very well off with the understanding of ALF, whereas ACLF is a problem. The guidelines are to protect the brain and I think we have um, understood well. That's why the incidence of cerebral edema has come down. Protecting the brain is the main thing. That's why preemptively starting them on CRRT, following the ammonia levels, do not wait for them to go down, ventilate them early. And there has to be uh, aggressive monitors, neurological monitoring and anybody who has acute liver injury, when they start off with a liver injury, you can use simple tests like the number connection test to monitor when they're going in for use of a transcranial Doppler. So all of those things. And regarding hypertonic therapy, use of, um, uh, I think, um, UK, they have 30% hypertonic cell line. I, there's a big difference in the doses that we use. 3% might not be good enough if you use the same dosage and you're going to use a very big dose when you have to get 3% cell line. So the, um, I, I agree we have not had to use any boluses of uh, these drugs in any of the patients. But the indication is when they have uh, an acute crisis, when you feel uh, there is an ICP surge, which is evident on your monitor or there's pupillary dilatation, that is when you use the bolus of this uh, uh, mannitol or a hypertonic cell. And otherwise, um, we don't see the need for it as a routine measure. And you routinely monitor, madam, uh, transcranial Doppler or optic nodes at diameter? Uh, we do both. Um, ONSD might be not a good thing when they are spontaneously breathing. Once they go on to control ventilation, it's because uh, ALF is very rare, not very commonly seen. So just to keep our hands on skills, we use more, both both ONSD and TCD, and it's easily available at the bedside. So that's something we do. Which method of ICP monitoring will be ideal here in this situation? I know clinical monitoring is very very important, and uh, apart from uh, uh, transcranial Doppler. I think frequent pupillary check also would be very important. Yes. Any other method by which we can monitor? Well, pupillary ICP? checks and frequent ammonia checks will go a long way. If your ammonia persistently stays high, despite putting them on high volume CRRT, again, it's a bad indicator. Yeah, how would you, uh, how soon would you intubate? Whether you would like to wait, you know, or oh. the encephalopathy to worsen, or you would intubate the patient, put him in I ventilator on grade one, grade two, grade three, or grade three. At grade uh, two, I think it should. At grade two, encephalopathy, we start intubate them. So preemptive intubation and ventilation will definitely help us to grade prevent. Two, I wouldn't call preemptive. Uh, it's definitely indicated when they reach grade two in fulminance at least. You see, I, I, have, agent, I have my like, views on this. If I can, yeah, yeah, please, 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 please. Uh, I, I believe that we lose more patients from aspiration pneumonia secondary to uh, uh, acute liver failure than actual grade three or four encephalopathy. And hence we change our practice going back about seven, eight years ago. We intubate early and we intubate really early. We, we will not wait. We will intubate really, really early. Uh, uh, and and our, our reasoning is they, they aspirate at the drop of a hat really. So we, we will go in very early because the other thing is if you intubate them early, then you can manage them uh, better. It is better for nursing staff because these patients are thrashing, they are withdrawing, they are dehydrated, they are sweaty. And, and 
intubation just gives gives you more control to put in lines, do invasive procedures, and X, Y, Z. That's why we tube really early. And which sedative agent would you use? I mean, propofol is quite uh, commonly used in majority of the centers, and Dr. Govil has already answered the question. What is the role of dexmedetomidin in these patients? Why do you want to sedate these patients? Any take on this? I mean, uh, there's no point using it. There's no point using it acutely. There's absolutely no role of using it acutely. Uh, once once you've done what you need to do and things are moving in the right direction and you are struggling to wean and with sedation, then yes. Why, why use something which is so expensive and complicated, really? You know, you. you uh, yeah. Uh, the, we see. do use dexmedomidine sometime in initial phase when the patient is in grade two and he is too restless or in withdrawal when he is like fighting and thrashing everybody and want to pull out everything. Most of the time at that juncture, everybody decides to intubate. But sometime if you are not intubating a short time period, that time this dex can be used. That is what we are doing. I'm yeah. That is what I'm saying. We are using. Dr. Srikant says, could they wanted to ask something? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Very yeah. interesting question, actually, sir. What is the ideal Dr. time Shrikant. for liver transplant in yellow phosphorus? Is there any evidence of preemptive liver transplant in yellow phosphorus considering the high mortality? As early as possible, I would say. I mean, I would like to hear from the others also. Okay. It's one of the, I think, uh, challenging uh, topic, uh, means part to manage. Now, okay. what we have seen with yellow phosphorus patients are the moment they become encephalopathic, they go down rapidly. So we thought we need have to transplant them the moment they become encephalopathic because they are they have a ALA for a long period and most of them recover, at least 95% will recover without a transplant. But those who develop encephalopathy ultimately need a transplant or they die, has been our initial observation. But over the last two, three years, what we've seen is if we intubate them and then continue uh, supporting them. We've had a lot of patients who've recovered at, after that stage also. Another interesting finding in these patients is a uh, toxin accumulates in the body and after the new liver goes in also, it redistributes and causes the same amount of cholestatic injury to the graft. So we've had struggle with two of our patients where we, we, we had to plasmophorize them for a long period. Uh, we'd lost a patient also. So that changed our uh, thing that we don't have to aggressively transplant them immediately after they become encephalopathic and they get intubated. So we do give them some time, uh, extended period of, they don't get better with three episodes of three sessions of plasmapheresis. They take a longer time. Um, once the encephalopathy gets better, that is when we think about weaning. So I, I, I do not agree that they should be transplanted as early as possible. It does not give good results as you think because the cholestasis continues and um, the biopsies have shown that they have significant amount of fat in the liver as compared to the previous pre-transplant uh, uh, biopsy. It's the so same. Plasma pheresis, preemptive or early plasma pheresis would definitely help them. Again, we do not know Probably because we don't, don't have, have these are all anecdotal data that yeah. So I mean the LTSA consensus, I mean, we were part of it, we initiated it. Um, we do recommend plasma paresis, but that's not the gold standard of therapy. We do not know it works, but we've been giving it because the problem usually happens four days after ingestion. We do not know if that patient who's ingested and come to us will manifest with liver injury also. So by doing a plasma paresis, even before liver injury happens, that is what many of the centers are doing. I do not think that is warranted because looking at the data from government hospitals, even if they've ingested a fatal dose, which we think is a fatal dose, four days later, they do not manifest signs of liver injury. So we should not be aggressively plasmapheresing them at least signs of liver injury. So we uh, have a cutoff of 250 uh, of transaminases. That is when we start uh, doing plasmapheresis on them. This is a bit tricky, actually. You keep, if yes, you keep on is. waiting, they will deteriorate rapidly and you're left with nothing, actually. Uh, when, so, when they are in a center where you can do everything. And, uh, Madam, uh, the same thing uh, by doc from Dr. Srikant Sarsapude. So, what is the uh, physiological basis of plasma paralysis in these non-immunological patients of yellow phosphorus? Any of the panelists? If, if, if uh, Govil sir or Ravi sir also can want to talk on this. I have no idea. I've never seen one. I don't even know what it is. Um, I, I am also not having that much experience in yellow phosphorus patients. I have seen only very few in my clinical practice here. 
Madam, what is your take? Again, we do not know what it does because it's a protoplasmic poison. We are not removing toxins. We are definitely not removing the tox toxin by doing plasmapheresis. We think it might work on the SIRS part. Yeah, it's it's the IRS part and the supporting liver. Supporting liver. Yeah. A little bit the byproduct of the liver failure, they are being removed. Definitely the ammonia is being removed, the other toxins like likely to be removed. So maybe that way it may be helping. And on the same same contest, uh, the uh, one of the delegates has asked, like if you do this extracorporeal therapies, so does it uh, confound the patient for the uh, uh, liver transplantation? Because sometimes the is it uh, sometimes the transplantation get delayed because the patient is improving or some kind of things. Is it a confounder all the extracorporeal therapies? But I think we definitely gave get some time to really think whether that patient will require transplant or not. It gives so us all some these time extra, to really as Doctor Akila has already said, all these extracorporeal therapy, the evidence is still only with the plasma pheresis and little bit evidence and much more established practices mass after plasma pheresis i would say there are few centers in europe who are like die hard for uh, mass and is still continuing but others they have got very less like it's a, just a case series presentation so if you are desperate nothing to do if you want to do something if somebody is trying it is difficult to comment upon and uh, sir what about the infection risk because some centers they prefer to do crrt instead of uh, doing the plasma paralysis because uh, they feel that it increases the chances of infection. Look, the chances of infection is there in every extracorporeal circuit, whether it is a CRRT or plasma paralysis or TORE or cytosol, wherever we are taking out blood and sending it back, there are multiple connections, there are multiple joints, there are multiple points where it can be get contaminated. So starting from the putting a line, and connecting the circuit and priming the circuit anywhere it can get connected, uh, uh, contaminated by the hands of the performer, the person who is performing the procedure. So again, the risk is always there. If I compare, I'm sure Dr. Ravi and Dr. Akila can comment on this also. If I compare plasma pheresis vis a vis CRRT, I would say in my mind, the risk of infection is same, except in plasma pheresis, we have to replenish the antibiotics because those antibiotics which are protein bound they will go down the drain so we have to load those antibiotics again if we don't do that then the circulating blood level the blood uh, turf level of those antibiotics will go down and then the they will not be effective that is my take on so that is only difference between crrt and plasma paralysis which i can see even in the crrt we have to increase the dose of few antibiotics which are water soluble and going down the Rain. So, if we are not doing the, those changes and sepsis is breached, asepsis is breached somewhere, then you had it. Dr. Ravi and Dr. Keela can also highlight their experiences. Now, when it comes to plasma pheresis, it's more, or more of a non selective removal, isn't it? It, rem it removes all complements and immunoglobulins. With CRRT, we've understood the dose modifications which are required with antibiotics. That is not understood with plasma pheresis, how much needs to be replaced. So I think there is a difference there. And we did see high, high incidence of sepsis in patients who've had plasma pheresis. We used to do them for early allograft dysfunction post-transplant, post-LDLP. But we did see a higher incidence of uh, septic complications in those patients. We do not know. We can't attribute it to the procedure alone. These are patients who have been cholestatic, high ML, been sick for post-op. I mean, that could have contributed. But that's something we've seen. Going by theory, I think plasma pheresis might have a higher risk of infectious complications because they seem to be removing all the protective factors, immunity factors as well. So it, it's all theory. I mean, there's nothing comparing the, them without uh, for the incidence of sepsis. Dr. Ravi Kumar, do you, I mean, is we there? Have seen, we have seen absolutely no difference in infection. What you must realize is the pathology. Mm -hmm. You have got a pathology where a patient is at a four to six time higher risk than a normal individual septic patient to get a severe infection. So the, the pathology is there, you're a sitting duck. It does not matter what cannula, where you put, they are a higher risk. Uh, I cannot vouch and say one is more infective than other. Uh, I do not think that there is a difference at all, really.
So there is one question, which type of plex uh, is recommended? I think centrifugal plasmapheresis is more uh, beneficial. Uh, what is your take on uh, this entity, uh, Dr. Akula and Dr. Govilsar? I mean, what do you think? I think uh, all of you all, I mean, must be doing centrifugal plasmapheresis. No, we are not doing centrifugal plasmapheresis. Earlier, we were doing centrifugal plasmapheresis, but we have shifted to the um, uh, pump-based plasmapheresis, and we are using the CRRT machine for plasmapheresis. There were two, three reasons that uh, blood bank people were not interested in doing the high volume plasma pheresis with extended time. We do close to 30 to 40 bags of uh, plasma and take it to six to eight hours of plasma pheresis, which they hardly do because they are time bound people. And then many times they want to put saline or albumin in place of plasma, which we don't do. And then they want to put some steroids, some uh, Avil, some other fancy drugs, just to avoid any reaction, which we hardly do. So, uh, in last four or five years, we have completely taken over the plasma pheresis from this blood bank people, and we don't have got centrifugal pump except in blood bank. So, we are using our own CRRT machine. Okay, I don't know whether it's right practice or wrong practice. Thirty to forty bags of plasma is still. I mean, I think it's still very high volume plasma pheresis. I guess. I mean. With plasma pheresis, I mean, six to eight bags of plasma should be sufficient. And uh, we can... No, it's not sufficient. If you go to the literature, the evidence which is coming up is a high volume plasma pheresis. So six to eight is, I would say it's a dal mein chok lag raha hai bas. nothing much. Yeah. I may be wrong. I'm not saying that what is right or wrong. I mm -hmm. can just tell you my practice and my experience. Okay. Hard evidence is not there for anything. So it is just a guesswork. Yeah. Dr. Okay. Akila and Dr. Ravi also yeah, we can. We're still yeah. using the centrifugal pumps. Um, we have support from the blood bank all the time. We've not uh, experimented with the one on the CRRT machine. And yes, uh, we also do a high volume plasma pheresis in these patients. Professor Ravi Kumar, sir. We use ultra filtration. Uh, CRRT. Yeah, we, we use our own machines. Our dynamics are different. We are a public healthcare system, you see. Yeah, so our dynamics are very different. We are, we are nationally poor, but not individually poor when it comes to healthcare. <laughs> Sir, uh, very interesting question. If Dr. Divya also can answer, what is the cutoff of INR and uh, before doing any procedures? And do you routinely transfuse FFPs and other blood products? As I said to you in my talk, no. Yeah. The answer is no absolutely no, because uh, this is something I'm quite passionate about. What you must realize is, is if you give somebody platelets, uh, what are you trying to achieve? Are you trying to increase the numbers? Uh, because in vitro platelet is not a qualitative platelet. Okay, you can increase the numbers, but you cannot guarantee that you have uh, improved the coagulation. That is number one. Gone are the days when we were doing lines blindly, okay? We now do lines under direct vision in real time. I do not see a point of reversing coagulation. I mean, the expert is sitting in your panel asking how many trachees he's done without reversing coagulation in liver failure patients. Yeah. We, never, we never do. The only time we will give them some factors is if the platelets go below 20, okay? Because there is some weak evidence that the incidence of intracerebral bleeds goes really high up below 20. It's not a, it's, mm. it's not a robust evidence. And what about INR, sir? What cutoff value of INR basically? Up? Suppose the INR is five, six, till you uh, means put a line without giving any FFP or any, or do you do a take? We, we do early tags in these patients. So we, we hardly, yes, we see INR and this and that. We, we hardly rely on them, to be honest. Why, why would you rely on INR in a liver failure patient when you have a tag? Absolutely. It is not available in all the centers except for some corporate hospitals. It's not available in majority of the hospitals, probably. They're no, being I, guided I, by INR values. Yeah. I, I get that completely. But uh, all, all I'm saying is... Uh, Clotting factors for invasive procedure in liver patients 
all it does, it gives you a false sense of security. It does not reduce bleeding, is my view. But I'll stand corrected. They are always in a they are in a procoagulant state, as you already say. Like in so the INR values may not have any implications pertaining to insertion of lambs. See, some of the patients are on midodrine. What is your take on midodrine? I mean, would you prescribe or would you differ from writing uh, midodrine to your patients? I mean, I still have a query about this. I'm I'm curious to know what is the role of midodrine in patients with the liver failure. Sir, go with, sir. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, midodrine per se for liver failure, midodrine works in whatever we do, it works in HRS if we are shifting patient out of ICU and in the room and, or going home. So, in place of early pressing, we go to the... It's midodrine. like a vasopressor, yeah, in the tablet yeah, form. That's it, nothing else. In acute liver failure, I don't think so. Midodrine is having any role or anybody is using it. At least I am not using it. Any role of uh, plaques in uh, Wilson's disease? Dr. Akila. Uh, Wilson's is a, there's a class with recommendation for plasmapheresis and Wilson's disease, actually, Wilson's abuse ALF. So uh, it can be done, definitely. And any role of GCSF in patient for ALF who are not candidate for liver transplant? Have you used any experience? The question is from Dr. Babu to everyone. Uh, we don't have any experience in its use, actually. But um, ALF, I do not know if there is any evidence. But ACLF, there's a lot of evidence coming up, especially in patients with the HBV-induced um, ACLF, more so in the Asian centers. One from China and one from India also have, sh have shown some evidence in the use of GCSF and ACLF. But I don't, I'm, I'm not sure if there is anything, any role in ALF. I mean, any studies have been done in ALF, I'm not aware. So we have been we we have used a lot of GCSF of late uh, uh, for HPV uh, failures uh, and and uh, it's very early to say whether it makes a difference or not. Uh, you know, uh, I'll ask me the same question in two years' time. I might be able to give you a better idea. Coming back to your question of medrodirine. Um, in my part of the world, it is a drug of geriatric ward. This is how we call it. So you will get this classical patient who will be on noradrenaline of 0 0.01. Mm -hmm. And every time you stop that, the blood pressure goes to 60. Yeah. And you start it, it goes to 80. These are the patients who need mid midodorine. Yes. Um, the, the biggest problem with midodorine, you, you must realize is, as Dr. Goel said, you send them to the ward on tablets, that's fine. But after 72 hours, you get a tachyphylaxis to that drug. But it's great for us as intensivists because by the time they are in the ward, so it's not your problem anymore. Uh, so it's okay, isn't it? Uh, so yeah, we do use it, but it's a drug for geriatric patients in our place. Sir, any role of thrombopoietic analog in thrombocytopenia in ALF, sir, before no. transplantation? Absolutely none whatsoever. I don't know if people will agree or disagree so, to it. Dr. Ravi, can I ask one question to you? Yeah. The dose and the regime of GCSF, what you are using? As, as I said to you, boss, the doses are decided by the nurse. We just prescribe it. I don't know. I will, I will let you know in a text what is the <laughs> dose. I, I genuinely don't know. We, we just prescribe it. Uh, and, and uh, to be honest, uh, because of the dynamics of GCSF, uh, it is a three speciality decision. So it is decided between the intensivist, the standalone hepatologist, and the hematologist. Uh, it, is not, it is not a uh, single man decision. So th there is a protocol, but I, I will look it up and I'll send it to you if you need to. Sir, I think we have no more questions left and with the interest of time, uh, I would like to conclude the session and before concluding, sir, just uh, your own one opinion on message to our all uh, new trainees and uh, fellow students, sir. Ravi, sir, anything you'd like to tell them? Well, okay. uh, if, you, if you're talking clinical, then, then I'll, yes. I'll say that if you get a patient of liver failure at 2 a.m. Um, uh, in the morning on your shift, don't complicate things, just give volume, oxygen and antibiotics. And, and let time take its own course. Yeah. You know? Sometimes yeah. you just have to step back and let time work. 
uh, don't make it complicated. It is when you make complicated things go wrong, is, is my view. If you're talking about exam, uh, you know, uh, uh, most of the things uh, in my uh, talk were at some point related to an exam. So that is all I can say. Really. So particularly you're in the EDIC exam, sir, mm. because you are the examiner. Yes. So what, what necessary you would like to give to our exam, exam going students? Well, that, that's a very generic question, isn't it? I'm not going to yes, go. Some of the students are uh, uh, going for EDIC exam also. So if you can highlight some of the important aspects. But this this whole talk is about livers. It's not about the eating yeah. exam. That's yeah, a talk yes. itself. So we, let's not talk about yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, okay. I would like to ask another thing to you. There are a lot many trainees and many of them are looking to go to United Kingdom for career enhancement, maybe for the training or maybe a job prospect. What is how they should proceed or what is your take on, on that? Uh, the 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 system is opening up massively of late, sir. Uh, you know, uh, if if you look at it, there, there is a there is a big uh, 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 recruitment drive, uh, and and I think it will carry on. However, I always say this to young trainees who have young families uh, that uh, that the grass is always greener on the other side. It is not as good and soft at at, as it used to be once upon a time. Uh, the, the resources are constrained, the working conditions are difficult, uh, and uh, it is not the same what it used to. You will get the training, don't get me wrong. I, I, I don't think uh, you can match the training curriculum and the training standards, uh, but uh, you, will have, you have to look at the, the whole package. In terms of whole package, uh, at this point, if I was in this situation today, in when I came to this country 22 years ago, would would I have considered an answer? Is probably no. I didn't sell it well, did I? No. Sir, sir, what is your one message to our trainee, sir? From your your uh, angle. So my take on is just work as you should be work honestly, hard work, and there is no shortcut to hard work. Absolutely. And, okay, and I'm not a full-time intensivist. I do part-time theater and part-time ICO, unlike the other two people. Uh, I think it is a fascinating field. Uh, you need a lot of perseverance to continue. Just keep up the perseverance. Dr. Divya, if you're available. Critical care requires a lot of hard work, a lot of precision. So I think we're on the right foot. Thank you. So, sir, with this, uh, uh, we, we are concluding the today's uh, meeting. And uh, it's a, uh, definitely, a, I thank all the uh, panelists and uh, particularly my, our speaker, Dr. Ravi, sir, uh, for enlightening us today about the acute liver failure. And I think if, sir, is okay, we can have to have, to have more and more sessions in the future also. In, in fact, with all of us and all of you, uh, with uh, from my uh, best of luck and best wishes to all of you, sir, from Apollo Hospital, Mumbai, sir. Thanks very much. Thank yeah, you. another next topic. Can you just highlight what is your next topic? And yeah, yes, the it's, it's on the there. tropical infection, sir. I, I'll send you all the invitation by WhatsApp. Thank you, sir. Sure. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thank you, sir. Good night. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Thanks.